Welcome back into Live Now from Fox. I'm Andy Mack, and certainly some big news in terms of science and technology. Of course, it kind of feels like out of a science fiction movie as we're learning more information. Elon Musk tweeting this out saying the first human received an implant from Neuralink yesterday and is recovering well. The initial results show promising neuron spike detection, and it's a big monumental step here in terms of this technology. For more on this and to give it context around it, because there's a lot into this, we want to bring in right now Liam Drew, a former neurobiologist, an author, a reporter, journalist covering medicine, biology. Liam, thank you so much for joining us here on Live Now from Fox. Just give me a grasp. How big of a deal is this to have that neural link, that brain chip there to kind of help connect a computer to a brain? How big of a deal is this? Well, I think all of us that have been following this field have been waiting for Neuralink to finally put their device into, into human volunteers. Um, this is a very exciting field in general at the moment. Uh, there's multiple companies working in the space, but since Neuralink were founded in two, 2016, um, very well funded, very exciting group of scientists recruited there. Um, the field has really been waiting to see what they'll do and how their technology performs in, in humans. Yeah, and it's, it, like you said, just the name on top of it, Elon Musk and Neuralink, does that maybe give it more credence? Does that maybe make people more exciting about maybe the rapid ascension of this technology? Well, Elon obviously brings a lot of attention to whatever he does. Right. Um, I think he's certainly, uh, he's brought massive investment to the field. Uh, and I think it is very exciting how quickly they've moved. They both developed an implant and a robot that does the neurosurgery, which in itself is quite an exciting development. Um, I think all of us know that Elon Musk can be quite polarizing. So I think uh, for some people it's fantastic to have him at the head of things. Other people it creates uncertainties, but it certainly brings attention. And, um, and yeah, like I said, I think the whole field is waiting to see what this trial will bring. Yeah, and it's the first one there as well. But of course, uh, several months ago, the Food and Drug Administration gave approval for a trial saying they wanted to enlist people ages 22 and above who are living with different disabilities like this. Uh, can you maybe tell me maybe the specifics on where this application goes from here? And obviously talking about those people that potentially could get a brain chip to help with function and different things. Maybe what's the uh, kind of grouping there for this trial and how may it benefit people? Right. Yeah, so, so the, the recruitment advert for this trial uh, asks for people that have no use of their hands, uh, either owing to a spinal cord injury or ALS, Lou Gehrig's disease, as you, you say over there. Um, and so sort of research of this nature has been going on for about 20 years now. The first ever person to have an implant of this type, it happens in 2006. And this was a young college athlete who'd been stabbed in the neck and paralyzed. Um, and so for, for sort of 18 years, there's about 40 people now have had these types of implants put into them, made by other companies. Um, and it's really about sort of restoring functionality to these people. Um, and so they can sort of control a robotic arm, for instance. So the sort of the implant is sort of recording brain activity and through sort of AI decoding of the neural signals it picks up, it will, you can sort of teach it that if, if the person sort of repeatedly imagines moving their hand left, then the sort of robotic arm will move left. Um, and then latterly, there was an amazing paper last year, a woman who, out of UCSF, a woman who, an academic study, a woman who uh, had a stroke and lost the ability to speak. And she actually was able to communicate uh, by thinking about syllables, thinking about words and training the decoder to recognize the sort of neural patterns that corresponded to the words she was thinking of. And then they wired this up to an avatar, an on-screen avatar, which spoke for her. So, you know, it really, that Elon has sort of got a lot of attention. He gave a famous interview with Joe Rogan in 2020, where he sort of, you know, looked sort of way down the line and imagined, you know, everyone having one of these implants. But, but really it's a field, and, and as this trial speaks to, it's a field that's grown up around the idea of there's these people living with severe paralysis who could massively benefit from the restored capability of, you know, just even being able to use their iPhone or to surf the web through these devices would just just restore independence and functionality to these people. So that's, that's really the main context of the, of the wider field. 
Yeah, and that's so good for so many of these people that, that have those potential disabilities or those complications due to different things that happened in their life. And of course, Neuralink there from Elon Musk. But like you mentioned, there are other companies that are also kind of doing the same thing as well. Uh, does this maybe kind of bring everyone along and how much kind of scientific kind of breakthroughs can we see based on the fact that maybe one company sees it and then the other companies try to replicate it? How much can this kind of continue to raise the field as a whole? Well, I think what's interesting is that there's probably about six or seven main companies that are developing these implanted brain, these brain computer interfaces. So they're actually implanted. So, you know, you only a person that's sort of living with severe paralysis is, is sort of, it's only ethically viable to sort of for those sorts of people to participate in a trial of an implanted device. Um, and I think what's interesting is that the sort of six or seven companies have all sort of put their money on slightly different approaches. So, you know, do you need to record from thousands of neuro individual neurons as, as Neuralink going after, or is a few hundred okay? Or can we just record the average of different neurons with a sort of slightly more superficial device? So I think, and then there may be trade-offs between the sort of potential power versus the stability of the recording, the stability of the decoding. And for a person that's sort of trying to use this every day of their life, stability may be much more valuable than sort of potentially very high performance. So what we're going to see with uh, several of these companies now in human trials is, is the sort of see those trade-offs and see, see which ones are most important in real-world settings. And um, yeah. Yeah, so I think it's just a yeah. compare and contrast, and I think that's going to be very interesting. Yeah, and seeing science kind of happen in real time where people make different hypotheses and they go down different paths to see potentially which works best on based on what their uh, kind of thought process is as well. Uh, but like you mentioned, all these applications, maybe differently, what can maybe the applications be in the future? What can this kind of technology evolve into? Where do we see it going potentially? Well, that's, yeah, that's the big question. I mean, so it's, like I said earlier, when, when, Musk was talking to, to Joe Rogan. Uh, he was certainly envisaging a world where, you know, symbiosis with AI and sort of bi-directional communication with the brain. I mean, it's very easy to go science fiction with these predictions. Uh, there's not to say it won't happen in decades time. Um, I think at the moment, like I say, we're just looking for something that's stable and safe, like that stability and long-term performance and how the brain reacts to implants is all things that we still need to learn. Um, and there's a whole other world of people that are trying to sort of do sort of surface recordings of brain activity, which would be much more amiable to mass market devices, uh, much more cruder decoding, but that might be able to pick up whether you're tired or whether you're focused. Um, so we're sort of really opening up a new sort of route of communication between our brains, our most private of organs and and sort of external devices. So. Yeah, it's, it's going to be very interesting. I mean, the, it's it's easier to read activity than to sort of put information into the brain, but that's the sort of bidirectional communication is is another thing on the table. So, yeah, it's watch yeah, this Yeah, the future space. is definitely uncertain, but right now an exciting time in the field. Uh, Liam, Drew, any parting words, any more thoughts? I know it's a very complicated, complex uh, kind of topic here. Anything that we missed that you might want to touch on before I let you go? Well, I, I think I would just say, I think, the, you know, the ethic, the medical ethics and ethicists need to keep up with this. You know, there's going to be interesting questions about privacy if these devices are in there reading our neural activity. And also, you know, who's in charge of this? You know, if, if there's a device between your private thoughts and your sort of actions in the world, you know, if, if something goes amiss, if something goes wrong, you know, who's responsible, you know, who, who's, who's in control? So there are, there are certainly pressing ethical questions that need to be asked and, and frameworks developed to, to regulate this stuff. That is very interesting.